Hi everyone, my name is Mark, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Some nights, Sandra Melgar finds herself lying in her small prison cell, and she can't help but reflect on the twists her life has taken. She never, in her wildest dreams, imagined she'd end up a widow and a suspect in her husband's murder. It was unfathomable that a year and a half after his tragic death, a grand jury would quietly indict her, and almost five years later, a jury would convict her based on circumstantial evidence alone. No clear motive or physical proof tied her to the crime. Now, at the age of 59, every day since her husband's passing has been nothing short of a nightmare. Sometimes I still think I'll be going back home. I catch myself wanting to tell him things, forgetting that he's gone, Sandra shared during a recent interview. Her blue eyes were red and puffy as tears streamed down her pale cheeks. It doesn't feel like he's really gone. It's more like he's just temporarily away or on a trip out of town. I try not to dwell on it. She paused for a moment. I know I'll see him again. For the past 10 months, Sandra has called the William P. Hobby unit her home. This women's prison sits amidst the Texas countryside. Sandra manages to stay in touch with her friends and family, many of whom still firmly believe in her innocence. She chats regularly with her daughter and only child, Elizabeth Liz Melgar Rose, though the noisy prison environment and Sandra's soft voice sometimes make for challenging conversations. She writes letters to her friends, who keep her posted about her Pomeranian Lola, who was there in the house on that fateful night. Most weekends, she gets to spend a couple of hours with a rotating crew of friends and family, thanks to one of her closest pals who coordinates these weekly visits. Liz stands as her mother's strongest advocate, taking it upon herself to be the spokesperson and passionately discussing what she sees as a grave injustice that has robbed her of both her mother and father. I've never seen my mom so shattered and devastated, and she's never been able to bounce back from that. She'll never be the same person. There's always going to be this void in her life. I can't put into words just how deeply this has affected her because it's been a monumental loss. Liz recently shared. Sandra grapples with the memories of that fateful night on December 23, 2012, the night her husband met his tragic end. Her inability to recall the events of that night has raised suspicions among investigators, who found it rather suspicious. Nevertheless, Sandra remains steadfast. She did not commit the crime. As Sandra lay in her prison cell, her thoughts often drifted back to the evening she and Jim had celebrated their 32nd wedding anniversary. On December 23, 2012, Sandra Melgar was startled awake by the incessant barking of their dogs. Her vision blurred as she struggled to orient herself in the dim room. Her body ached and her head throbbed as she lay on the closet floor, hands and feet bound behind her back, her undergarments soiled. Sandra, who stands five feet four inches tall, tried to stretch out her legs and roll over to peek through a gap under her closet door, but her bindings and two hip replacements hampered her movement. Even if she could free herself, a chair blocked the door handle from the outside. In the bedroom closet, her husband of 32 years, Jim Melgar, lay lifeless, bearing 31 stab wounds to his hands and chest. The white walls were now stained with blood, and a gray telephone cord bound his feet. A medical examiner would later confirm that all of Jim's wounds were defensive, showing that he had fought valiantly against his attacker, rather than attempting to flee. One particularly brutal strike had nearly severed his right thumb, likely contributing to the extensive blood spatter in the closet and bedroom. The bedroom itself appeared to have been ransacked, with dresser drawers left in disarray and clothes, books, and pill bottles strewn about the floor. Sandra's black purse and red wallet had been rifled through, their contents scattered atop the blood-speckled white comforter. A small white medical stool at the foot of the bed bore blood stains, suggesting it had been used as a makeshift surface for a knife. Nearby, a wooden chair's back was marred with scarlet drippings. In the partially filled jacuzzi bathtub, where Sandra and Jim had celebrated their 32nd wedding anniversary the previous evening, items bore witness to the tragic events. A white blouse, a green towel, and a silver chef knife with a six-inch blade, stained with blood droplets in every crevice, revealed a chilling narrative. Police later identified this knife as the murder weapon, 
Just hours before this horrific night unfolded, Sandra and Jim had been celebrating their enduring love, marking their 32nd wedding anniversary with a dinner at their beloved Mexican restaurant. Their plan had been to continue their celebration in the jacuzzi, complete with candles, cocktails, strawberries, and whipped cream. Even after more than three decades together, Jim and Sandra remained deeply in love, as she would later convey to the authorities. Their journey had started during their senior year at Lamar High School, with Jim's unruly black hair and a somewhat awkward teenage mustache. He had been immediately smitten by the 17-year-old girl with blue eyes and blonde hair seated in front of him in class. Initially, Sandra had resisted Jim's advances for weeks until she finally relented, agreeing to join him and a group of friends for ice skating. Little did she know that Jim had orchestrated the entire event. As she arrived, it was just Jim and his best friend, who mysteriously disappeared after her arrival. Jim's teenage charm and a penchant for corny jokes, later known as Jim jokes, eventually won her over. Sandra admired his humor, intelligence, and thoughtfulness, while Jim appreciated her intelligence, down-to-earth nature, and lack of pretentiousness. Soon, they became inseparable, and in 1980, two years after their high school graduation, they sealed their love with a courthouse wedding in downtown Houston. In the jacuzzi that night, on the anniversary of their union, Sandra and Jim reminisced about their shared history and dreamt of their future together. They talked about selling their home to embark on a world tour, visiting places like the Grand Canyon, Ireland, and witnessing the Northern Lights. Jim, just five months away from retiring as a computer programmer with the Houston Independent School District, envisioned buying a beachfront property where they could ultimately settle down after their adventures. As they spoke, they took turns giving each other massages, culminating their evening in a moment of intimacy. After two blissful hours in the jacuzzi, as Sandra would later recall, their dog's barking interrupted their peace. Jim, wrapping a towel around himself and slipping into Sandra's slippers, headed out of the bathroom to attend to the dogs. Little did she know that this would be the last time she would see her husband alive. When she awoke approximately 15 hours later, she found herself bound in her closet, hands and feet tied, her body sore, and her undergarments soiled. Jim was nowhere to be found, and once again, the dog's frantic barking pierced the silence. However, this time, voices inside her home accompanied the barking, prompting her to scream out in desperation. Herman Melgar stood outside his brother's house just past 4.30 in the afternoon, puzzled by the unanswered door. Jim had invited Herman and his family over for dinner, but now neither Jim nor Sandra were responding to calls or the front doorbell, which struck Herman as odd. Jim's black truck sat in the driveway, and Sandra's silver car was parked inside the open garage. Herman instructed his family to wait by the front door while he ventured to the backyard, glancing over the fence. Jim, always busy with home improvement projects, had a plastic tarp hanging from the pergola on the back porch, evidence of his recent work. Returning to the front yard, Herman decided to check the laundry room door inside the garage. If it remained locked, he thought they would leave. To his surprise, the door was unlocked, so he entered the house. The inside was dimly lit, gray and stuffy. All the blinds were drawn shut. The dogs barked and jumped around as Herman opened the front door, creating an eerie atmosphere that his daughter, Marissa, would later describe as unsettling. There's just something not right, she would recall. It was then that they heard muffled screams. Herman rushed to the back of the house and discovered a large chair propped against the closet door in the bathroom. Inside, Sandra lay on the floor in a black satin nightgown screaming for help. Herman and his wife, Maria, attempted to remove the tightly bound restraints around Sandra's arms and legs. Herman retrieved a pair of scissors from the bathroom, and Sandra kept asking, Where's Jim? Where's Jim? She had bruises on her arms, including a dark one on her left bicep. After freeing her, she went into the bedroom and found Jim's feet protruding from the closet. She checked for a pulse, though it was evident from his cold, pale, and naked body that he was deceased. Sandra covered him with a blue jacket, and Maria escorted her back to the bathroom. 
Sandra was in hysterics when paramedics arrived, making it difficult for her to communicate with Stephanie Roberts, the first paramedic on the scene. Roberts noted in her report that Sandra remained in a state of shock and had periods of crying, and that she had no sense of time and last recalls a time of about 1 a.m. this morning. She did not realize that it was evening time and approximately 15 hours had passed. Police documented the bruising on Sandra's hands and arms, along with a small scratch on her left thumb. There was no apparent blood on her. Sandra explained to the police that after Jim had gone to let the dogs in, she left the bathtub and entered her closet to get dressed. She told them, The next thing I remember is waking up at an unknown time in the closet. And at one point, she screamed for help, but seemed to have fallen back asleep, possibly experiencing a seizure. Sandra's health was compromised by a series of medical conditions, including lupus, an autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and grand mal seizures. Due to these seizures, she had resigned from her job as a licensed vocational nurse, believing that she could no longer perform her duties effectively. In the weeks leading up to Jim's murder, Sandra had experienced auras, which she described as a warning sign of an impending seizure. During seizures, she told the police, she would sleep for hours and awaken in a state of confusion, disorientation, and significant pain. As crime scene investigators meticulously examined the house, Sandra found herself in an interrogation room at the Harris County Sheriff's Office. She expressed discomfort with the cold temperature. I did ask you to take a polygraph test. Yes. I did. And I'm and too shaken and I'm freezing. And Sheriff Sergeants Sean Carazal and James Doucet conducted a three-hour interrogation, probing Sandra about the 36 hours leading up to Jim's death. Sandra was soft-spoken and complained of a headache. She provided specific details about some aspects, such as removing her boots in the bedroom, changing in the bathroom, and recalling their conversation in the jacuzzi. However, with other details, her memory was less precise, and she struggled to remember. She initially mentioned Jim being gone for 15 minutes to let the dogs in before she exited the jacuzzi, but later suggested it might have been about five minutes. When questioned about the timeline, Sandra admitted the following. I'm so bad with time, I just, I just, I'm taking guesses here. Carazal inquired about their future plans, and Sandra leaned forward, burying her face in her hands and breaking into tears. Carazal raised the possibility of her being involved in Jim's death, but Sandra cut him off, stating, That's it. That's it. I, I, I need a lawyer. I, I'm not talking anymore because you guys are just trying to torture me here. Doucet encouraged Sandra to take a polygraph test. Are you familiar with a polygraph exam? Would you be willing to take a polygraph exam? Which she declined, citing nervousness, shaking, cold, and concerns about it being used against her. Her refusal seemed to frustrate Doucet, who interpreted it as a sign that she had something to hide. As the interview continued, Doucet told Sandra the following. You are. We're going to find out everything about you. We're going to find out everything about your husband. We're going to talk to everybody in your neighborhood. We're going to talk to everybody that you're related to. Sandra hoped that this extensive investigation would redirect attention away from her, stating, I hope you're somewhere else too, because it's, it's not me. Then Doucet probed further and asked Sandra the following. And you and your husband, how would you describe y'all's relationship lately? We have a great relationship, even better lately. As the interrogation neared its conclusion, the detectives expressed their frustration with Sandra's lack of memory. They questioned how she could have blacked out during the moments when her husband, whom she claimed to love dearly, was brutally stabbed just feet away in the bedroom. They asked why she hadn't heard his screams. Carazal pleaded with Sandra, saying, I need you to help me. I need you to help me. I need you to help me on this. I didn't hear anything, Sandra replied, her face still concealed in her hands. I didn't hear anything. Carazal and Doucet exited the frigid, confined room, leaving Sandra crying with her face in her hands. Later, 
Carazal would contact the Harris County District Attorney's Office to file murder charges, while Sandra remained at the station and crime scene investigators continued their work at her home. The DA's office ultimately declined to pursue those charges, citing a lack of evidence. The news of Jim's murder quickly rippled through their neighborhood. Concerned neighbors congregated outside, engaged in hushed conversations, speculating about a possible home invasion gone awry, and harboring fears of a potential return by the assailants. Some residents went as far as bolstering their own security by installing cameras and floodlights on their homes. The Melgars were recognized by their neighbors as a reserved couple who typically kept to themselves. Occasionally, they would catch a glimpse of Jim working in the yard or Sandra coming and going from the garage. Curiously, one neighbor recalled being in his garage until one in the morning on the night of the murder and couldn't recall any suspicious activity in the neighborhood. To be honest, if anybody was going to get robbed, it would probably be me because the garage door was wide open. I'm there. It was just me messing with my stuff. If someone were going to come down and try to rob somebody, they'd be like, look at that dude. Let's just go in there, tie him up and take all his stuff, the neighbor remarked. Two days following the murder, Liz met with Carazal and Doucet, revealing various items missing from the house, including a TV from the bedroom and Sandra's medication bottles of hydrocodone and phenobarbital. She had previously informed detectives about a backpack containing a gaming system and games that had been left in the garage. Liz also shared insights into her mother's seizures and health issues. She's in quite a fragile state right now, she conveyed. It seems that she's undergoing some post-traumatic stress as well. I mean, maybe something will be jogged in her memory later. It's hard to say. Unfortunately, no significant breakthroughs resulted from this information. Liz persisted with follow-up phone calls and mentioned damage to one of her parents' rental homes. Eventually, the authorities stopped responding to her inquiries, leaving both her and Sandra in the dark regarding the progress of the investigation. A year and a half later, in July 2014, Sandra was discreetly indicted for Jim's murder by a grand jury. Grand jury proceedings, shrouded in secrecy by state law, left the public in the dark about the discussions and evidence presented during those proceedings. Sandra's case moved at a sluggish pace, even after the indictment. It passed through the hands of at least four prosecutors in the district attorney's office over the next three years, until it landed on Colleen Barnett's desk in May 2017. Barnett had returned to the DA's office in January of that year following a four-year hiatus during Kim Ogg's tenure as district attorney. Throughout her 24-year career, Barnett had earned a reputation as a diligent and fair prosecutor, according to both her colleagues and attorneys who had faced her in court. She had handled over 70 murder trials, including the capital murder case against Suzanne Basso, a woman executed for luring a mentally disabled man to Texas under the promise of marriage and subsequently murdering him. Barnett was fully aware of the challenges in Sandra's case. No apparent motive, no confession, and no direct evidence linking Sandra to the crime. It was a challenging case, but one I believed in, she asserts today. During the 13-day trial commencing in August 2017, Barnett portrayed Sandra as a calculating murderer who meticulously plotted Jim's demise, luring him into their bedroom with the promise of intimacy. Barnett told the jury that Sandra had tied Jim's feet with a gray telephone cord before using a knife to inflict a fatal wound from his chest to his neck. Barnett emphasized the presence of a bag of sex toys found on the bed, which Sandra later claimed was a gag gift from a friend. Barnett conceded that she couldn't definitively pinpoint a motive for Sandra's actions, instead presenting various theories, such as Jim's life insurance policy with HISD or Sandra's purported desire to end their marriage. However, as a Jehovah's Witness, her religion prohibited divorce. Sandra's attorney, George Mack Seacrest, a respected legal figure in his own right, painted a different picture of the seemingly frail woman seated at the defense table. Seacrest asserted that Sandra was a victim of investigators who had prematurely settled on a theory within two hours of arriving at the crime scene, an argument he supported with their initial attempt to file murder charges while crime scene investigators were still processing her home. Seacrest highlighted the lack of physical evidence connecting Sandra to the crime, noting the absence of her blood at the scene and the absence of cuts on her hands. 
He proposed an alternative theory. Sandra had fallen prey to a home invasion, suffering a head injury and being bound in her closet while intruders killed her husband. For the jurors, observing Barnett and Sechrist clash in the courtroom was akin to witnessing a heavyweight boxing match. As the attorneys sparred, Barnett delivered a significant blow, aided by Celestina Rossi, a blood spatter analyst and crime scene reconstructionist from the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office. Rossi testified that the crime scene did not align with a home invasion scenario, as there were no signs of forced entry. The bedroom dresser drawers remained undisturbed, and she pointed to a lit candle on Jim's nightstand as evidence that no struggle had taken place near the closet where Jim was killed. Rossi affirmed that the majority of the blood was confined to the closet, with the exception of spatter on the back of a chair, the white medical stool, and speckles on the comforter. According to Rossi, this spatter likely resulted from the injury to the artery near Jim's thumb. She concurred with the medical examiner's report, asserting that all of Jim's wounds were defensive, and she noted his loaded handgun, inches from his body in the closet, which appeared untouched. You're never going to shoot your spouse, even if she's coming at you with a knife. You're going to try to disarm her, Rossi stated, concurring with Barnett's assertion that Sandra had murdered her husband. After deliberating for eight hours over two days, the jury of eight men and four women found Sandra guilty of murder, sentencing her to 27 years in prison, well short of the potential 99-year maximum sentence. We figured at that point she would be in her early 70s and maybe have a chance to see her grandchildren, the jury foreman would later say, speaking from his home a year after the trial, while opting to remain anonymous. So it was a humane decision, frankly. Do we think this woman is a threat to society? None of us thought that. Sandra let out a shriek and nearly collapsed into her seat when District Judge Kelly Johnson read the verdict. The courtroom, filled with supporters who believed the trial was a mere formality to prove Sandra's innocence, was left in stunned disbelief. For weeks, they had tried to reassure Sandra that everything would turn out fine, perhaps to sustain their own spirits, but suddenly everything crumbled. It was as if they had spent the past three weeks deceiving their loved one. As Sandra was escorted out of the courtroom, clad in a red blazer and relying on a cane, she paused to embrace Liz one last time. When they parted, Liz crumpled to the courtroom floor. I just remember the room spinning, and I felt like I was completely alone there. I think everybody expected the jury to return a not guilty verdict, and it was just... I don't even have words to describe it, Liz recounted. I just felt completely lost and devastated, because not only had I lost my dad, and not only had this person gotten away with it, but now my mom is paying the price for it. And I've lost both my parents to a justice system that got it completely wrong. Sandra's supporters directed much of their anger toward Barnett, alleging that she twisted Sandra's words, exploited her religious beliefs, and concocted an implausible narrative that led to her incarceration. In contrast, the jury foreman maintained that Barnett's version of events made the most sense, ultimately pinning the blame on Sandra. He found her story inconsistent, citing her changing account of the time they returned home and how long Jim had been out of the jacuzzi before she retreated to her closet. He also questioned the authenticity of her seizure that night, referencing Sandra's medical records, which indicated stable seizures, and her visit to the neurologist following the murder, during which she made no mention of the alleged seizure. The more you started listening to the things she said, the more you realized they didn't make sense, the foreman asserted, standing by the jury's verdict. Every step of the way when you really peel back the onion, you realize that she is lying. I would love to be able to believe her, but the evidence says otherwise. Admittedly, he added, we're people. Could we be wrong? Of course we can be. I don't think we are. A month after the verdict, Sechrist filed a motion for a new trial, outlining in an 88-page brief how Sandra had been convicted based on an inept investigation conducted by investigators who were clearly theory-driven and lacked sufficient evidence to support a guilty verdict. The prosecution's case was built on conjecture and hypotheses, which were not rooted in evidence, Sechrist later contended. Sandy didn't kill Jamie. However, Judge Johnson denied his motion, setting in motion a potentially protracted appeals process and representing Sandra's final hope to demonstrate her innocence. 
Seated behind a glass partition in the visitor's center this past July, Sandra steadfastly maintains her innocence. No, she softly asserts. Her voice, barely above a whisper, continues, I did not kill my husband. Her trembling hand moves to her mouth, and she breathes heavily. No, I didn't kill my husband, she repeats, shaking her head in denial. If not her, then who? I wish I knew. I wouldn't be here if I knew. Her breaths grow labored, and she clutches her chest, sensing the onset of a panic attack. This is a nightmare, she says. Sandra clings to hope for a future release, whether through a successful appeal or parole. Her eligibility date is February 2031, when she will be 71 years old. Having heard the complex and emotional case of Sandra Melgar's conviction for her husband's murder, do you believe in her innocence? Or do you think the evidence against her was compelling enough for a guilty verdict? Please share your insights and opinions in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and see you in the next one.